In the run-up for the election, we spoke about Democrats flipping the Senate, which didn't happen. We discussed the potential of Biden flipping Texas. Uh, no, not quite. And even discussed the possibility of a Democratic trifecta. A swing and a miss on that one, too. Now, to slightly defend our credibility here, we were never saying that these things were dead certs, or even all that likely. We were just saying that they could happen. The fact we were even having these conversations in the build-up to 2020 was largely because of polling, which suggests that all of these things were possible. And that's a big deal. Po polling isn't just important to so-called journalists like us as they make easy, clickable thumbnails. No, polling is important for the campaigns too. They use polling to pick policies, choose which issues to talk about, the media markets they want to play in, and where to hold campaign events. Good polling isn't just useful to help the media tell a narrative of the election, it's also vitally important to the campaigns. So in this video, we're going to discuss polling. Looking at our video thumbnails, it seems that something went a little wrong, so we're going to discuss how off the polls were, why these issues occurred, and whether we should trust pollsters going forward. Before we start though, a quick shout out to the Daily Briefing. For those of you who don't know, every day we release a summary of the day's news events, allowing you to catch up in just a few minutes. You can watch it over on the TLDR Daily YouTube channel, you can listen in your favourite podcast app, or you can read about it in our newsletter. Links to all three options can be found below. Also, to celebrate our 100th episode, we're doing a live stream where I do a quickfire rundown of the year's 100 weirdest, funniest and craziest news stories of 2020. There's a link to the event down below, so head over there and click the button to be notified when the event goes live. So, let's jump right in by assessing quite how wrong the polls were, because it would be a bit unfair to write off the whole polling industry before we analyse the results a little bit. Now, it's worth saying before we start the analysis that we don't really know the answer to this question. I know it's in the thumbnail, but the honest answer is that the remainder of the video is a little speculative. We have some information about the election results, but with full data analysis and recounts set to come, there is still far more to know. Also, throughout the video, we're going to be talking about polling averages produced by organisations like Real Clear Politics and 538. There are obviously some terrible pollsters out there, but today we're going to be talking about the field more generally, so the polling averages are far more useful. A lot of people when evaluating polls like to compare the prediction to the reality. If the polls say that candidate X is going to win in state Y, well, did they win it? This is far from an ideal way of measuring the success of pollsters, but let's go with it for the moment. Using this method and applying it to the presidential election, I think it's fair to say the pollsters did a pretty decent job. They correctly predicted that Biden would win the popular vote, and they also correctly predicted the electoral college result in Biden's favour. When we're looking at the presidential race, those are certainly the biggest calls, both of which were correct this time round. We're being too generous? Sure, well let's take a look state by state. Did they get it right there? Well, pretty much, yeah, they did. Assuming the current results hold, pollsters correctly predicted 48 out of 50 states, only getting Florida, North Carolina and Maine's 2nd district wrong. As I said though, this binary, right or wrong, isn't exactly my favourite way of measuring pollsters' success. Comparing results like this ignores the magnitude of the polling error. Take this for example. If a poll said that Biden was going to win California with 98% of the vote, and then the results come in and Biden only got 63.6, we'd have to class that as correct, because, well, the pollsters said he was going to win. Using the same metric, we'd say a prediction that Biden was going to win Florida with 51% of the vote was a failure when he ended up scooping 47.9%. Sure, they called Florida the wrong way, but they were a hell of a lot closer than that Californian pollster. So, rather than looking at hits and misses, where pollsters didn't actually do that badly in 2020, let's look at the vote margins, how far the predictions were from the reality. Let's start by zooming back out again to national polling. 538's polling average shows that the final polling on election day, polls gave Biden an 8.4 lead in the national polling. Now, we don't have the final numbers just yet. As I said, recounts are still ongoing, and no states have officially counted all of their ballots yet. In fact, the New York Times says that most states have less than 2% of the votes to count. 
but some, like New York State, Massachusetts, and Maine, have a significant number more to count. With these states all leading Biden's way, it's possible his margin could increase further. But as things stand, Biden won nationally with a 3.8 point margin. This could tick up slightly, and it's likely to end up somewhere around 4 points, making the polling average about 4.4 points out. Let's leave that there for the moment and talk about the states. Now, polls might have called Florida, North Carolina, and Maine's 2nd District wrongly, but these weren't the only, or even necessarily the biggest misses of the night. Well, Maine's 2nd was, it was literally the biggest miss of the night, being a full 11 points out. Before we get into states though, this table was pulled together by 538, and it compares Biden's polling lead, how much the polls thought he'd be ahead by, to Biden's lead stroke deficit in the actual result. And the final column shows us how many points the results were out by. Anyway, like I said, Maine's second district was the biggest miss of the night, out by 12 points. Wisconsin, Iowa, and Florida were also pretty big misses, all out by six or more points. By 538's own admission though, this table is a little misleading. Polling in the states that matter, the 18 states and congressional districts that they categorized as competitive, showed that polling was more accurate, underestimating Trump's performance by an average of 3.7 points. So we're looking at a national polling error of 4 points, and a 3.7 point error in the battleground states. Is this a bad thing? Well, I'd say not really. As we emphasised a number of times in the run-up to the election, even the very best polling will have a natural polling error. At the end of the day, pollsters can't talk to every voter to find out how they're going to cast their ballot. That would just be an election. And even if they did, they couldn't account for the people who changed their mind last minute, decided not to vote, or whose car wouldn't start on election day, preventing them from casting their ballot. There's always going to be some polling error, and historically, a four-point error isn't all that bad. As we said in our polling videos pre-election, it's broadly expected that there'll be a polling error of around three points. So while a four-point error isn't ideal, it's not too far off where we'd expect it to be. Some theorise that polls are getting worse over time and shouldn't be trusted. And, well, that's not quite true. This table, again pulled together by 538, shows that while the 2012 and 2022 elections weren't that great for pollsters, missing both by four points, that's not all that unusual. Historically, this is the kind of variation we'd expect to see. Also, a number of people are keen to highlight that the polls always underestimate the Republicans. And while this was twice true for Trump, that may be more a Trumpian phenomenon than a broader underestimation of the GOP. After all, remember I said 2012 was also off by four points? Well, that time the pollsters underestimated Obama, while 2000 also saw the Democrats underestimated, this time by five points. So if polling isn't getting much worse, and the data shows broadly that polls aren't too far off the expected polling error, then why is this a big news story? Well, firstly, polls have just become a much bigger part of the US's election cycle in the last decade or so. After the polls that had a zero point polling error in 2004 and 2008, polling really cemented itself as part of the election media ecosystem. With that increased praise and attention comes increased scrutiny when the polls get things wrong. Secondly, especially in this election, people really wanted to find certainty and hope in polling, especially Democrats. After four years of Trump and in the middle of a pandemic, people were more willing than ever to put their faith in polls, leading to some being vastly too reliant on their accuracy. Thirdly, as elections become closer, these polling errors get accentuated. In the days when elections were won by large margins, the polls could be off by a decent margin and still predict the winner correctly. Today, with polarisation increasing and major electoral swings seemingly a thing of the past, races are just going to be far closer. So even small polling errors could lead to a complete miss. Which really is the biggest issue here, one that we should all be working to resolve, and it's about expectation setting. Just because polls suggest that something might happen doesn't mean that it will, especially when the margins are tight. Just because we said that a democratic trifecta was possible and put the odds at 70% didn't mean that it was going to happen. 
If you're rolling a dice, 70% only gives the Democrats the 1 through 4, while Republicans get the 5 and 6. Toss that die, and you'll see that Republicans maintaining control of the Senate and blocking a trifecta was always very possible. Polls always have a certain degree of uncertainty. Even the best polling is going to have errors. So when polls say things are likely to happen, that's what they mean, likely. It looks like in 2020 they were slightly further out than the three-point expected polling error, but not significantly. There's clearly work that pollsters can and should do to correct these issues and make future polls more accurate. They need to work out if the weightings in their samples are accurate. They need to make sure that the right people are answering their polls, because with Trump supporters trusting the media less than ever after four years of Trump in the Oval, it shouldn't be all that surprising that his supporters were less willing to talk to pollsters. And thirdly, they need to identify which errors need to be corrected in the 2022 and 2024 polling, and which are just specific to Trump and the pandemic environment. And those are just some tasks that I thought of off the top of my head before the full analysis of polling is being conducted. Safe to say that pollsters have some work to do ahead of the next election to ensure that their polls are accurate going forward. However, maybe it's our expectations that need the most work. For some, this kind of polling error is just too much to accept, in which case polls are almost always going to be disappointing for you. If people are expecting the polls to be perfect and they're annoyed with a four-point polling miss, only one point out of the expected range, then maybe it's our expectations that need to be recalibrated too. As I said though, we'll review this all again when we have the full results and when counts have finished. So let's stay curious and paying attention to what happens when we have all of the information. Be sure to subscribe to the channel and hit the bell icon to be notified when we release future videos, including on this topic. Special thanks to our Patreon backers who make videos like this one possible. And if you want to see your name at the end of videos, then you too can back us on Patreon. The link to that's in the description.